Hi, and welcome to my Bernina Embroidery Software Mastery Lesson 1 with Material Girls Quilt Boutique. This course today will be working within um, the virtual lesson as a companion to the exercises that are found in the Embroidery Software Workbook, focusing mostly on Bernina version 8.2 Embroidery Software. This workbook can be loaded from uh, downloaded from our website, um, which you can see on the screen once you go to our website, materialgirlsquilt.com. Travel to the Bernini University tab, then select Embroidery Software Education. And under that page, you will find the four separate workbooks that will be um, applying to the Bernina Embroidery Software version 8.2. Now, the screens today specifically apply to 8.2 but the information in the basis will apply in some form to all versions of Bernina Embroidery Software and to Bernina Art Link. Okay, let's get started. Now, once you've opened up your Bernina Embroidery Software, <clears throat> we're gonna be covering mostly today the basics. I'm going to jump right into exploring the toolbars and information from there, and then I will work back um, into lessons on lettering, a basic lesson on editing, and a little bit on monogramming. Then I will focus on some help and reference manuals um, for you to use as you learn and navigate your software. When you open your, your screen, your design opens into the embroidery side of the software with a blank design uh, work book open. Across the top of the screen, you're going to find the title bar showing you what software you have open and if the design file you have has a name or has been saved with a name, that information will show up here. The toolbar below that is what we call the menu bar. The menu bar has a variety of drop down um, selections that you can make as well as a lot of these items here also relate to icons that are found outside the menu bar. The, this set of toolbars that are up next could be in a variety of different locations or order depending upon your software. They, these toolbars are movable and if you notice that at the beginning of some of the bars there's this vertical dotted line, that would be where you would left click and hold and drag to a new location. So you can kind of put these toolbars in an order that works best for you. First up is going to be the canvas toolbar. This is the toolbar that we use to toggle between artwork canvas, embroidery canvas, and embroidery library, which we will cover more about artwork canvas and embroidery library in a later lesson. Next up is going to be the general toolbar. This toolbar is going to contain basic window tools such as cut, copy, and paste, print. It also is what, where we use to launch special um, Docker and dialog boxes and for your use. A lot of the icons in here are going to be familiar across the Windows platform for you to use. Next up is going to be the zoom bar. The, this toolbar will change the zoom level that you have on screen. And this hand is the pan icon that you can move, use to move the design on the screen. In the drop down, there are some pre selected I, um, percentages that you can zoom to, as well as we're able to select a object and zoom in using our mouse tools. Next up is going to be our transform toolbar. This transformation toolbar is what we use all items that we use for editing design, size, uh, rotation, mirror images. We have the view toolbar, which on my screen is the one right below it. This is what we use to change the view of our screen, showing a hoop, no hoop, grids, um, artistic view versus design view. And then we have the toolboxes. Our toolboxes run down the left-hand side of the screen. 
each one of these toolboxes has a variety of tools and icons that live inside of each toolbox that is associated with what it is. So think of it kind of like your filing cabinet. Inside each one of these drawers contains additional files and features from within your software. You'll notice that some right now on my screen are grayed out, meaning that I'm unable to select them. That's because I don't have a design open or I don't have something selected in the embroidery field. So therefore the icon will not be functional. Across the bottom of your screen, you have what we call the stitch bar. This is where you'll find all the selection um, types of stitches, fills that you can use and or effects that you can use in your embroidery design. Underneath of this, we have the color palette or the color toolbar. Again, both of these toolbars can be moved to a location that works best for you. So it's very easy to um, manipulate these toolbars. Right now, what I currently have open is the default color palette. This default color palette is going to be what opens anytime you open a um, blank design or a new design field. If you open a design, only the colors shown in the design are going to show up in the color palette. And then there's lots of additional icons and things in the color palette here. Uh, we have a pick color, we have apply. We can add and remove color from this color palette. You can also arrow down and up. And then we have a few features that allow us to hide, um, remove. We have color wheel and then my threads chart all of which we will cover more in depth in later lessons. Running down the um, right hand side of the screen, you're going to see what we call Docker windows. There are a variety of Docker windows that are available. Um, the most commonly is going to be color film. And right now the Docker windows are what we call on, a, on an auto hide, meaning that if I click on it, it opens. But when I navigate away after a certain amount of time, the Docker window will close. If you'd like for the Docker to stay open at the very top of the Docker where it says what type of Docker it is, there is what looks like a push pin. If you'd like the Docker to stay open, we click on the push pin to turn it down. So think of it, you're pinning it to the board so that it doesn't um, move. And the color film is the docker that I prefer to use and leave open all the time. And then at the very bottom of your um, screen, there is what we call a status bar. So you'll see down here height and width. Um, other information will that will appear there would be um, size, location, the number of stitches, the type of fabric if you've selected one. It's also a, a bar that allows you to or gives you a software prompt that if you're using a particular tool it kind of tells you what you're to do next when you're using that particular tool. Now in your workbooks pages 11 uh, 11 through, I think it's going to be 15 here. Yes, 11 through 15 are basically um, icon cheat sheets. Basically, it goes through each color for each toolbar and gives you the formal name for each icon that you're seeing on screen. So as you get more comfortable, you won't need this chart to help you know what tools are. The other thing that you can do is when you take, you're unsure of what a tool is, if you hover your mouse over top of the tool, initially you'll get a little um, icon, uh, a little dialog box that tells you what the icon is. If you hover long enough, you get the name of the icon, a short description of what that tool does, and then while it's open, if you want additional help, you can press F1, and then the help box will open up uh, specifically to the location that talks about that particular icon. 
we're going to be working with lettering basics first. Now, one thing to note when I am um, working through the lesson, when I say the word click, I am meaning for you to left click. And if I want you to right click, I will designate right click. So anytime you hear click, that means that you are going to left click on screen and anytime I will then say right click if I specifically want a right click. So with your embroidery software open, we have a new tab open and we currently looking at a blank embroidery design screen. I'm actually gonna go ahead and we're gonna do a file save as so that we can go ahead and pre-save this particular design that we're going to do so that we have a um, recovery for it. We're gonna go up to file, we're gonna to go to save as. We're going to navigate to the location as to where you want to save the file. I'm going to save it in this particular folder. I'm gonna call it lettering basics. We're gonna leave the file type as the Bernina version eight file and we're going to hit save. Now you'll notice that the tab at the top of the design area reads the actual file name. This is helpful, especially if you're working in multiple files to have them named as to what they are versus having to figure out what was in design one, design two, design three, so on and so forth. And you'll also see that that name appears at the very top file name bar. Now, the next thing we need to do is to open some lettering. The lettering tool is found in the digitized toolbox. So over here on the left hand side, we're gonna click on the word digitize. And you'll notice down in the digitized toolbox that we have lettering with a large red A. If you're not seeing that on your computer, uh, arrow down using the arrow inside the digitized toolbox until you can find the letter A. So we're gonna go ahead and click on lettering. We're then going to start typing. However, before we start typing, the system is telling us in that status bar what to do to start typing. And we're gonna come over to the design screen and it says press mouse button to start text. So I'm going to click on the screen. You will see a cursor appear. I am going to type in the word Bernina and I'm going to hit enter. Okay. Now, depending upon how you're in your software before or now, some of you may be seeing the word Bernina showing up here in pink, and some of you may be seeing the word Bernina that looks like it's been embroidered. This stitched version of the preview is called design, um, Artistic View. And I want to work in design view today. So we're gonna hit the letter T on the keyboard to bring us back to design view. Now, the system defaults to the London font with a particular height to it. So if those aren't what you want, we double click on the lettering to open up the object properties box. Inside this box is where we change the font and the height and your spacing and if you have a different baseline that you want to put the system in. We're going to use the drop down box here under the word next to the word font and we're going to find the Ketchikan font. Now it's easy because it's right should be right there but you could also just start typing in the box and the system will start filing through. You will notice that some of the fonts in this box have these red like zigzags next to them and some of them towards the bottom of the list are going to have what looks it's two blue T's that stand for true type. That the red fonts with the red zigzag next to them are the fonts that come pre-digitized in your software. And then the TT fonts are the fonts that are installed on your computer. They're not pre-digitized. 
So therefore, um, some of them will work, some of them won't. You have to play with it, and we'll talk about um, the true type fonts in a moment. So I'm going to use the Ketchikan font. In the height box, I'm going to place the height at 15 millimeters. Now, if you notice, my system is reading to me in inches at the moment. And I'll show you how to change that. However, I don't need to go out of this box and come make the change and come back in. If you're working through a lesson or an item and you know that you want it, you know the millimeters that you want it to be in, or you know the inches you want it to be in. In this box, I'm going to type the, the number 15 and then I'm going to follow it by mm. And that's going to tell the system that um, let's convert this from millimeters to inches. So I typed 15 mm and I clicked, I tabbed away and the system converted that to 0 0.591 of an inch. Now, if this section here was reading at mm, I could type here 0 0.59 in and then the system would convert those inches into the appropriate millimeters. We're gonna leave everything else there the same and we're going to click OK to confirm our changes and close the dialog box. Now, if you set your zoom scale up at the top at 100%, the lettering will show in actual size if you have calibrated your screen. I will talk about calibrating your screens. Let me find where that went. Um, in a later lesson, um, mostly because Windows 8 and Windows 10 do not need to be calibrated, but I will show you how to calibrate. So at 100%, this is actual size of the design. So if I took a ruler and measured on screen, it would show at 3.91 inches wide and 0.69 inches tall. And I can see that by looking at the bottom status bar of my screen and it just gives me a preview of size. I would like to have three copies of this particular, or four copies of this particular word. And the quickest way to make copies is to do what we call clone it. So with your lettering selected, and you would know it was selected if you clicked on it and it turned pink. Pink means selected. I'm going to right click and drag down and let go and that will quickly create copies. Okay, so that's what we call in the system is quick cloning, okay? Right click and drag and I could just right click and drag all day until <clears throat> I had the number of copies that I wanted. On my screen, you currently can't see the picture of a hoop, of an embroidery hoop. It's just not visible. So if I wanted to see the show hoop up here at the top uh, in the um, view toolbar, you're going to, if you left click on show hoop, it's going to give us a toolbar, a, a hoop, embroidery hoop. Sorry, I'm going to get my act together here. Um, now, the hoop may not particularly be visible at the moment. So in your zoom box, in the drop down, when you have show hoop turned on, the option you, is there for you to zoom to hoop. And now I've zoomed out far enough that I can see all of this particular embroidery hoop. Maybe this isn't the hoop that you want or the hoop that you're going to design with, or you have a couple different brands of machines and you're designing something for a different brand. If you right click on the show hoop icon, the hoop dialog box will open. You can choose the machine from a variety of brands, not just Bernina's. You can then choose 
the hoop that we, you plan on using. So in once you've defined the machine, you, it only gives you in the hoops, the hoops that work with that particular machine. And so we would select the hoop and then we're going to tell the machine what foot we're going to use. And the reason for that is when you get into larger presser feet, the embroidery field that you have gets smaller. And so if we define it now, we are ensuring that we're not designing something that is larger than what we'll be capable of stitching once we get it to the machine and put on the appropriate presser foot. So foot number 26 is your good old standard hoop. And then once you hit OK, everything would be set up. Now I'm going to space these out here. I'm going to left click and drag one set of lettering to the top. You're going to see that everything moves, like it doesn't stay at the top. And the reason for that is um, right now we have auto centering turned on. So the software looks at everything that's currently design based in the screen and keeps it centered within the hoop. And that's just fine at the moment because I'm going to take this bottom one and I'm going to move it down towards the bottom of the hoop. And so I can kind of, you can keep doing that until you get it um, spaced apart in the appropriate location. Now the two sets of words that are in the middle of the screen, we want to evenly space all of this out. So the quickest way to align and re-space everything is one, we're gonna select everything. And you can select everything by either going up to the edit menu and choosing select all, or to the right of the select all, you're gonna see the defined shortcut for this particular tool. So control A, is select all and this is one that I use a lot. Now with everything selected we're going to come over to the arrange toolbox over here on the left. The first thing that I'm going to do is we're going to align the centers vertically so that we can make sure everything lines up through the center and then down towards the bottom of that toolbox we're going to choose space evenly down. Okay. So when we choose space evenly down, the system looks at the very top design selected and the very bottom design selected, and then basically divides it out by the number and puts them all so that they're all evenly spaced from top to bottom. In order for space evenly across or space evenly down to work, you have to have three items selected. Okay. Now, let's talk about changing color. So right now, everything on screen is selected. So to, to deselect them um, so that we're able to pick them all up individually again, I'm just going to left click outside of my embroidery hoop and then I can come back and I can left click and select one of my Berninas. So the letters have now turned blue. You're also going to notice in the color bar, color palette, do you see the blue squares that are hanging out in the upper right hand corner of the colors? That means that they're current, that's they're used in the design. So if you're looking at a design that, you know, you have a 56 uh, color, 56 color, color palette, but only the ones that show with blue squares in the upper corner are actually being used in the design. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and Let's repeat this and change the color for the other two words. 
So now, uh, that yellow is hard to see. Let me make him red instead. Now you have four separate colors of Bernina. And in each corner of those designs, you can of the color palettes, you can see the ones that are being used. I want to go back to the first Bernina. So we're going to go very up, back up here to the very first Bernina. And I want to show you how to change the colors of individual letters. So let's say you want the B one color, the E a different color, and so on. Right now, if you were to embroider this, it's all going to run in one color and you would have to be manually stopping the machine in order to be able to change the thread color. We're going to do this in the software so that you don't have to do that. So we're going to go, we're going to select the word Bernina. We're going to go up to the edit toolbox. We're going to find the function called break apart. I'm going to click it. Now, when you click break apart, your word is going to now deselect on its own. And if you come back over and click, you now have the ability to select each letter individually. Okay. So that means that I could come in and grab each letter and convert it to a color of my choice. So if I wanted a rainbow of color for my letter, I could do so. Now, the other thing that we can also do is with lettering, the first time you break it apart, it is still considered a letter. And this can all get very confusing, but the software still sees these as letters. So I could double click on my letter B. I could come in, I could change the font, I could change the size. So let's take this to a 0.79 of an inch and hit OK. And now I have a B that's much larger than the other fonts. I can use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move the letter um, to the left so that you can um, get it off of, from sitting on top of your previous letters, fix your spacing. It's easier to use the left and right arrows to move it versus trying to click and drag it because if you move it off of the, the um, horizontal plane, your, the bottom of your word's not going to line up. So by using the arrows to do those fine movements, it's going to be a little easier to keep yourself straight in, the, in alignment. Now, we can, let me show you a couple of things about zoom while we're here. If I wanted to zoom in on this uh, particular word, if I touch my magnifying glass, and then I'm going to come down here on screen and I'm going to left click and drag a box. And you'll see that dotted box. When I let go, it's going to zoom in around everything that was inside that dotted box. Okay. I could also use my mouse to zoom. So I could um, take my cursor and use the mouse wheel on your mouse to zoom in and out. And it's all based upon where the tip of your mouse is pointing is where it's going to zoom at. Okay. It's very easy to just keep clicking that particular um, area. I can also click the mouse. I can uh, click the magnifying glass, bring my mouse uh, down and I can left click. We'll zoom in and right click is going to zoom out. Okay, so there's lots of ways to be able to um, zoom in on something. I'm usually a box drawer and then draw inside and then it zooms inside the box, but it's completely your choice. And then to quickly zoom back out, you can drop down you can either zoom to fit 
and to fit is going to just zoom out far enough that you can see all of the embroidery design in the screen at once. And then zoom to hoop is going to zoom out so you can see the um, outer edges of the hoop. Now, let's go ahead and click the second set of lettering. And let's take a look at these handlebars. Okay. Now, the black squares that you see around a selected design are what we call uh, sizing handles. And so we can left click and drag on a corner handle to proportionally resize a design, okay? And we can use the middle handles to either only adjust the height without affecting the width or adjusting the width without affecting the height. If you hold the shift key down while dragging one of the corner handles, it will resize from the center out. So if I hold down shift and then click a corner handle, you'll see that it, it resizes from the center out. You'll also see in the little flag that's attached to my cursor, the percentage that I have increased it, as well as a size. Okay, make sure you let go of the mouse before you let go of shift when you are using that. Okay, let's look and select the third option, the third set of lettering. Now, we talked about the dark handles. Let's talk about if your handles are clear. To access the clear handles, we actually left click again on a design and those handlebars turn clear. Clear handles are rotation handles. So now if you click and drag on any of the corner handles, your word will rotate and you get a a, percent, a degree of rotation on the little flag attached to your cursor. The middle icons, and let me zoom in here so that you can see. In the middle of the design, there is there's a diamond on both the top and bottom and a diamond in the middle. These are skewing handles, okay? The top and bottom are going to skew you left and right, okay? And the side diamonds are gonna skew your word up and down. Okay, so you have that ability to slant or italicize your particular word or phrase. Let me come down here and let's, um, too, too far, and click on our fourth set of letters. And we're going to talk about what we call kerning. And kerning is adjusting the spacing of letters. And so sometimes on particular fonts and things, you may find a um, font that like the M's and the N's are real close together, or you've got a word with like I, L, L, and they all kind of run together and the spacing isn't right, or if you've got a, a highly decorative or cursive font and things kind of overlap. You want to adjust the space between those letters and not all the time do you need to adjust the space in all of the letters. Maybe it's just one or two that you want to fine tune. So with the lettering selected, we come up and we use the reshape function and reshape is up at the top in your transform toolbar. Um, it's also the quick key is the letter H, the shortcuts, the letter H for it. 
So if I click on the um, reshape object, you're going to notice that in the middle of every letter there is a pink diamond. Okay. The pink diamond is basically the handlebar for the letter. And so I can grab, left click, and drag left and right with the letter to move just the letter along the baseline, okay? You can't move the letter off the baseline. There's another trick I'll show you in a later lesson. But for the most part, you're able to be to adjust the spacing between maybe one or two um, letters depending upon you know the style of your particular font okay and then to turn off this function you would touch the escape key and that will uh, close out the reshape object tool when you are now finished with this particular design, so we can come up and hit the save function or control S that will save our design and then we can close it. Now let's talk about baselines. Let's open a new file so we can come up to our top toolbar. We're going to choose the new design icon. It's going to open up a new file. I'm going to go right ahead and I'm going to do a file save as. I'm going to call this lettering baselines. We're going to change the color of the background. Um, this is helpful. The ability to change the color of the background can be helpful if you're kind of deciding what thread colors are going to work on maybe a purple piece of fabric or something like that. So this kind of gives you a, a little preview as to if the colors are going to work on the fabric color that you're going to be embroidering on. So I'm going to go up to the menu toolbar and we're going to go up to design. And then we're going to come down to background. Now, there's a lot of things in this box. We'll talk about them at a later time. Right now, I'm going to focus on solid color. In the drop down, I'm going to pick a solid color. I'm going to pick white because I think it'll be easier for you to see. And then I'm going to choose OK. And if you have a hoop on, turn the hoop off and the color will show. Okay. Now let's talk about baselines. And baselines have to do with the a line that the imaginary line that a font or a word is going to follow. We're going to come to the digitized toolbox and we're going to come to lettering and we're going to right click on it this time. And when we right click on the lettering function, it's going to automatically open the object properties box for lettering. And this is one of the ways that I like to start my lettering. It just allows me the ability to, um, pre-choose my font and my size and all of that before we get into typing it out and then having to double click and come back in here is to me just saves time. So I'm going to type in the word Bernina. We're going to come to the font box and I want to use the Chicago font. So I'm going to open the font box and I'm just going to type in the word start typing in the word Chicago and the system will find it and apply it to the box. We're going to make it at a 0.75 of an inch in height. Okay. And we're going to use the free line vertical baseline. And so down here at the bottom where you see all your baseline, this is your vertical baseline. 
So selecting this, you've now told the system that you want it to stack your letters one on top of the other along a vertical line. I'm going to click OK. And you're going to see that nothing happens. Remember, in that prompt bar, it's telling you to click the mouse to start the text. Click anywhere on screen, and the word is going to appear. And if I zoom out to fit, you'll see all of it on screen at once. So using that, vertical baseline takes and stacks your letters one on top of the other. We're going to turn on the grid function and the grid can be found up right down from the hoop option. I'm going to left click on it. It's going to open up a grid. This is just going to help us use a, another baseline function here. We're going to deselect the first word because if I try it with this word selected and I try to go back into lettering, it's going to open up the lettering object properties for this word. And I actually want to type a new word. Okay. So we're going to open up lettering again. We're going to right click on the lettering box. We're going to type in the word embroidery. I'm going to press enter and type in the number eight. And then I'm going to press enter again and type in the word software. I'm going to use the London font. We're going to do a lettering height of 0.5 of an inch. And we're going to use the predefined baseline. And so what a predefined baseline is, is that the first line in your dialog box up here is going to clockwise rotate. The second line of your dialog box is going to be on a horizontal baseline. And the third line is going to be on what we call a counterclockwise baseline. So when you're using the predefined baseline, you need to have three individual lines of text in the dialog box. We're going to choose OK. Now, the system is asking us to enter a center point. We need to physically draw the arced baseline that we want to use. So we are going to draw a circle. I'm going to come over here on screen. I'm going to left click on one square. On, a, on the grid. I'm going to drag my mouse three grids over. I'm not holding it down. I'm just moving my mouse. Okay, so I don't have the click. I left clicked here. So left click here at an intersection and just move your mouse three grids over. Okay. And click. And then I'm just going to hit the word, I'm, I hit the word. I'm just going to hit enter. Okay. And your font or wording will appear in following that predefined three line baseline. Now, <coughs> with all the lines selected, we can click and drag it to a location so that um, especially if it landed on top of your word Bernina or anything along that lines. Okay. Now let's deselect. We're going to click off and that number eight is a little small in comparison to our other words. So in a predefined baseline even though we originally typed it in one dialog box, each one of these um, lines is independent of each other. So I can come and double click on the number eight and let's make the height of this one inch and let's click okay. 
And that's going to make the eight bigger than the other set of wording that it was associated with. Okay. Now, let's look at the any shape baseline. So the other, the third way to start lettering is just to press the letter A on the keyboard. A on the keyboard is going to open up the object properties dialog box for lettering again. We're going to type in the word best of the best, not the word, the phrase. Okay. We're going to set it up as 12.7 millimeters. So again, remember I'm in inches here. So I'm actually going to type, type 12.7 mm. Okay, and then I'm going to click away. That converts it to the half inch that it is. I want the Alice font. So I'm going to click in the font box and start typing the word Alice. And then we're going to select the any shape baseline. And we want a left justification. This just means that we're going to make sure that we start at the left of the line and not to center the word in the um, on the shape that we draw. We want it to be to the far left. And I'm going to click OK. And what's going to happen is nothing. Your system is asking for the first point on your curve. You physically have to draw the shape of this baseline. So I'm going to come over on the screen at an intersection and I'm going to left click. Left click, you always start a line with a left click and you're always going to end a line with a left click. You can also right click. Right clicks are going to start generating curves. So I'm going to, I left clicked. I'm going to come over, I'm going to right click, and then I'm going to right click. And you'll see that curve. It takes two right clicks in order to generate the curve. If you make a mistake and you don't like what you clicked, or maybe you clicked the wrong way, you meant to left and then you, you clicked right, the backspace key on your keyboard is going to be your eraser. And then I'm going to left click. Okay, so I've got three, what, one, two, three, four right clicks there and a left click at the end. And then I'm going to press enter when I'm done drawing my baseline. And what will generate will be the your wording following the um, baseline that you drew, making sure we're starting at the far left of the line and traveling as far uh, on the baseline as we need, okay? And that's going to be the any shape baseline. The any shape baseline, in my opinion, takes a little bit of practice because um, sometimes you will get things that are too close to each other or kind of laying on top. So. You may have to play with your letter spacing to get things to um, space apart. You may need to come into the reshape function and you kind of move a design, uh, manually move a letter, especially when you're looking at uh, curves and things along that lines or places, locations where the direction of the line changes. So, some things have to be played with a little bit with the any shape baseline. It's not as quick per se as using one of the um, straight uh, horizontal or vertical baselines. Now, you do have two other baseline possibilities in the system. So if I press the letter A, I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna type in the, um, what fun. Let's give it a, I don't know, let's see. 
we'll call it, we'll pick the bamboo font. So let's look at circle clockwise. So just like you drew earlier with the um, predefined baseline, I'm going to click at the center of my circle and I'm going to drag outwards, okay? So this is defining how, you know, this is gonna be a fairly steep arc. This is gonna be a much bigger arc. And then I'm gonna hit enter and then that's what we'll generate. If I um, do counterclockwise, we actually can do ovals as well with the clockwise and the predefined um, baselines. And so an oval is done the same way, except after the second click, we would drag left and right, okay, to get the oval shape, and then left click when I have it, and that's what will generate. And sometimes, exactly, it lands on its side, not where I wanted it, but you have the ability to rotate and move it into the location. Sometimes the baseline, the alphabets or words will generate in those clockwise baselines, not where you expect them to generate on the oval or the circle. And so those are your um, baseline options. So you have your standard free line, what I call horizontal. You have circle clockwise, circle counterclockwise, any shape, vertical, and then you have the predefined that has both clockwise, counterclockwise, and a horizontal baseline built into it. Okay, so that gives you just an option. Your embroidery does not have to have good old straight line text. Okay, so you can save that file if you would like, and you can close that design, and we're going to open a new one. In this, we're going to talk about editing. And so we're going to um, insert an embroidery design. We could open it, but we want to insert it. And the reason for that is I'm going to insert it into, it keeps me um, using a default color palette. It allows me that if I have anything set up in my software a particular way, um, like I've already got the background changed or we're gonna be combining two designs or something. We wanna insert a design into the file that's already open, okay? This also saves you, um, if you get into the habit of inserting a design, it will save you from accidentally saving over top of an original, okay? So we're going to use insert embroidery. So insert embroidery is kind of top center of the general toolbar. It is the piece of paper with the red zigzag and the blue arrow. So when I click on that, it opens the dialog box. It's the same dialog box that um, you would get if you did file open. Now, this is where um, it gets a little weird in Windows 8. 8.1 and 10 as to where the software installed your um, embroidery designs. The embroidery design folder that installed with your embroidery software installation installed in a public um, portion of your hard drive, meaning that if you were on a network, it could be seen on multiple computers. It also stopped, saved it in a library. And so over in this dialog box here, in this, what we call a file explorer, typically, uh, let me uh, close a bunch of this stuff. You're gonna have um, these options. Uh, your computer, if you have a hard drive, a USB stick plugged in, um, a CD-ROM, anything like that, you're going to see these options here. This is where you would see your C drive and things like that. 
you should see an option here called libraries. If you are not seeing the word libraries, you need to right click in this, um, this section of the file explorer and choose show libraries. And when you do that, your library will open. If you drop down, you're gonna find that you have an embroidery library. Inside this embroidery library, you're going to find um, your, um, let me, I have lots of things saved in here. In public embroidery, you're going to find Bernina M8 embroidery. And inside of there is where you'll find all the designs that come saved with your embroidery installation. So we're going to work in the animals and bugs folder. And inside of here, we're going to find the WP099. And it should be this bird that you're gonna open. And we're gonna click open. Okay, so there is our bird. We're going to select the uh, design again. Up at the top, we're gonna select design, we're gonna select background. This time, instead of changing the color of the background, we're actually going to put the picture of an article of clothing in the background so that we can preview size and spacing and all of that on a particular um, garment. So we're gonna put a, we're gonna move the dot to in front of factory article. In the drop down, we're going to choose, you see that you've got all sorts of choices um, to choose from. We're going to choose um, kids, t-shirts, and girls short sleeve front, okay? Girls short sleeve back, girls short sleeve front, okay? And then we're going to change the color of the shirt. And so under color number one, we're gonna drop down the edit and I'm gonna choose a, a light turquoise. And then I'm gonna choose okay. And you're gonna see if, you, if your screen looks like mine that okay, the background turned turquoise. In your zoom box, if you drop down, you now have the, the ability to zoom to an article. So if I zoom out to an article, you can now see the full size of the shirt. Now, there are things that you can do with the, um, you can load a custom shirt. You can also play with the scale of the shirt. So if we were to measure this, so I'm gonna hit the, the letter M on the keyboard and that's gonna turn my cursor into a ruler. And if I measured my shirt from armpit seam to armpit seam, and right now this is about 12, just about 12 inches, let's say. And my actual girl's kid shirt was eight inches from armpit to armpit. I would come back in and play with the scale until I got this measurement to coordinate with the measurement that applies to my shirt, okay? I'm gonna press escape to turn that off. I'm gonna zoom in to this bird here so that we can see it. Now, I had talked to you earlier, we mentioned design view and artistic view. So the view that my computer is currently showing in is what we call um, design view. It's rough, it's sketchy, uh, it looks like um, you can kind of see your underlay and your stitches. Artistic view is, there's two ways to get to it, okay? So we have the red zigzag up here on the toolbar that when we click it, turns into artistic view. And artistic view is what it looks like when it's been stitched. So you get a preview of what it's gonna look like. The letter T on your keyboard is what we use to toggle between artistic and design view, okay? Now, we wanna work again, I wanna work in design view. It is easier 
to work, I feel, it's easier to work in design view when we are selecting particular objects and individual things. It's harder to tell in artistic view if you have the right thing selected or what you even have selected. So it's hard to tell because in design view, in artistic view, if I click on something, you can't tell if you've got a hold of, do I have a hold of his body or do I have a hold of a wing? Because the dialogue box, dialogue box, the handlebars are just not as clear. Whereas in design view, I can tell what's selected. We're going to click copy. Okay. And so with our bird selected, we're going to click copy. And I'm going to zoom out here and I'm going to then click paste. Okay. And paste is the clipboard. And just like in any other um, Windows-based program, Control-C is copy and Control-V is paste. Now you'll notice when it pasted, it actually laid the other copy right on top of the other. So they're stacked at the moment. So one thing that when you're using copy and paste is sometimes you think, well, did it copy? Did it paste it? And you just keep pasting. Okay, and the next thing you know, you've got like 15 copies, one on right on top of the other. So down here on that status bar uh, towards the far right, we have a number. And on my screen right now, it says 7,570. That is stitch count. So you'll see that when I paste it, that stitch count increased to 15,130. So that tells me that something did happen, okay? So with the item, just like it is, we haven't done anything, all we did was hit paste. We're gonna come up to the mirror image and we're gonna mirror what they call X, or we're gonna flip left, right. And that will immediately flip the copied and pasted bird um, around so that we can see that it's there and allow us to click and drag on it to put it into the location that we want. Okay. Now, let's change the angle of this of, of our duplicate bird, okay? You can do one of two things. Remember, we can click on it again so that we have our rotation handles and I can rotate until the number 15 comes up in the little flag. Or with it selected, I can come up to the um, toolbar with the pencil and the arrow and I can type in 15 and hit enter. And it rotated it to the 15 degrees for me. Okay, and I'm just gonna fine tune its location so that I can make sure that they both are inside the embroidery field. And so if you have a hoop turned on, this red inner red line is your guideline. Your design has to be inside that red line in order for it to fit in the hoop. Now, He's cute, but he's a little boring because they're both the same color, okay? So let's look at using a quick tool to recolor a design, okay? So I'm gonna take my duplicated bird, I'm gonna select it, and we're gonna choose color wheel. Color wheel can be found down at the far right of your color palette. It's the, the what looks like a piece of pie and I'm gonna click color wheel. And up is gonna open up color wheel. The default color scheme is gonna be harmonious. You can change that to anything that you want. You see that there are nodes inside that circle that designate each color stop, okay? And then you can also see that you are can control the brightness. So if you want a darker color, or lighter color, you can um, control the brightness. 
you can grab a hold of each node individually, okay? You can adjust each one. If you want a um, quick way to adjust everything, the one uh, node here that's the, the um, circle with the outline here is the main control and you can rotate that and that will rotate all of your colors to new locations and to new colors, but still staying within the same um, hue and family. It's just a quick way and it's a fun way. So once you have found the colors that you like, you can click OK and the system will apply that to our color changes. So there's what our birds look like in design view and that's what they look like if we were to embroider them. Okay. Now, I want to grab a hold of just the head of our original uh, original copy of the bird. And the um, birds at the moment are what we call um, grouped. They're kind of glued together. I can tell that they're grouped based upon, in color film, these little icons in the corner tell me that um, the item is glued together or grouped. So I can't grab just the head. The way around this without having to ungroup the entire bird is to hold down your Alt key and click on the object that you want, okay? Alt is the way around the ability to of needing to group and ungroup designs. Okay. Now, remember earlier I said it was hard to tell in design view and artistic view as to what was selected. So here's design view. We know we have just the head selected because that head is the only thing that's pink, not as eye, not as plume, not as beak, just the head. If I hit the T to come into artistic view, you can't tell what is selected. Yes, there are handlebars here, so something inside this area is selected, but is it his head? Is it his eye? Is it the outline? You know, so that's why I um, do a lot more work inside of design view and I'll toggle into artistic view if I'm changing stitch types and things along that lines. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to double click on his head to open up the object properties box. This head is filled with a step fill and we have 30 different options for step fills. We're going to choose number six, and we're going to click the word apply, okay? So what apply does is it applies the change but keeps the dialog box open because we're gonna work through a couple of locations on this bird to change things. So rather than having to um, keep double clicking to open up the box, we can um, just apply it and leave the box open. Now, we're going to come down to the copied bird. I'm going to hold down the Alt key and grab just the lower portion of his wing. I am actually going to change, he's filled with a step fill, but I'm actually going to change it to what we call a fancy fill. And in the fancy fill, I have um, a pattern number 179. Okay. So we have 180 different patterns. This is a little preview of what the pattern looks like. 
and we're going to click um, apply. And then I'm going to come over to the screen and click and deselect it. So I'm going to click off. I am going to um, zoom out a little bit here so that I can um, see a couple of things at once. We're going to hold both the Alt and the Control key because I'm going to select two different things at the same time. And we're going to hold down the Alt and the Control. I'm going to select this swirl and this swirl. If holding down the control and the alt key at the same time are a challenge, you can hold down the alt, click one, make the changes, and then do the steps again on the other one. Okay? This stitch here is a triple stitch. I'm going to take and increase the stitch length to two and a half millimeters. My system is currently, as you can see, reading in inches originally because we did inches a moment ago in lettering. But this dialog box is millimeters. There are some settings in the system that cannot are not done in inches, even if you are set in inches. It th that this option here has to be done in millimeters. And then we'll click OK to close that box. And let's hit the T so that we can see the difference. And zoom in to fit. So you can see um, there is the fancy fill that we applied to the um, wing of the copied bird. You can see that these two fills, although they look similar, they are different. Um, this is a standard step fill and this is that step fill with pattern six instead. And then the tail feathers, it's hard to tell, but it's, you know, it's a half a millimeter longer than the stitching that is happening for the outline, but just an option. Now, we're going to add another design to this, okay? And in order to do that, we're going to, again, insert embroidery. I'm gonna, it's gonna open back up in the folder that I originally was in, which is animals and bugs. I'm just gonna come to this top navigation bar and I'm gonna click Bernina 8 embroidery. That's gonna back out one folder I'm gonna choose the alphabets and monograms folder and I'm looking for gilded silver three. And then I'm gonna click open. Okay. So it's gonna drop the design right there in the hoop for us. I'm actually going to take and place it over top of the copied bird's wings, okay, and place it on top of his tail feathers. Now, just so you can see what's going on here. All right. Now, if I were to embroider this right now, we are talking about it's gonna embroider all of those tail feathers and his body with all of the stitching and then it's going to stitch this new design on top, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. However, that is a lot of per se thread one on top of the other. And our software has the ability to remove overlaps. So removing overlaps is going to uh, delete or remove any excess stitching from underneath of a particular design. So with remove overlaps, we're going to select the item that is on top. We're going to go to the edit toolbox and we're going to choose remove overlaps. Okay. You may see a blink, you may see nothing happen, but if I come 
and move this out of the way. You can see that the system has kind of cut a hole um, in places for that particular uh, design where it was overlapped. Now you can see there's not a lot cut away because the system leaves some there so that you don't end up with a gap between the new design and what's underneath. So now let's go up here to our original bird's little top feather and let's reshape this. So I'm actually gonna go back into design view I'm going to hold down my Alt key and then I'm going to click reshape. Now you'll notice that when we clicked reshape, there is a variety of control points or nodes that are the um, blue circles. And then you have some yellow squares. So blue circles are showing you that they are curved um, control points. Yellow squares are straight control points. This green triangle and this red cross that are down here are um, start and end points. So you can see um, where a design is going to start stitching and then where it's going to end. We can actually um, move these control points to create a new shape. We can add control points to this line. Okay, you, adding a control point is if you left click on a line, you're going to get a um, straight line control point. If you right click on a line, you're going to get a curved line control point. Okay. You can select a control point and hit delete to remove it. You can take a control point, select it. So click on it so that it turns like royal blue. And if you press the space bar, it will convert it to the other style. So it'll change a circle to a square and a square to the circle. So if you've, you know, made a mistake and accidentally applied the wrong shape or anything along that lines, you can, um, like, I don't like that one right there. It's making a funny, Okay, so adjust and change the shape of your particular inside line of your plume. Okay. When you're done, press the escape key on the keyboard and then you can zoom out to fit. Now, if let's look at changing the angles on things. We're going to hold down the Alt key and we're going to select the copied bird's longest tail feather. So I'm gonna hold down Alt and click on his longest tail feather. We're gonna select reshape. And so let's, zoom in here to selected. So do you see these like green lines, okay, that are angled there? That is the stitch lines of that particular fill that we have selected. And the angle at which it's stitching is 165 degrees, okay? So this peach line um, that you see here that's usually kind of hanging out to the outside of your design. 
is defining the angle in which that stitch is going to fill this tail feather. So let's take and we're going to left click and drag that till it says 120 degrees. And you see that those darker green lines now follow the same path that the stitch angle line that you just converted converted. Okay. So just so you can see a difference, there was the original and there's the new stitch angle. And when we're done, you can hit escape on your keyboard to turn off the um, reshape function. Now we're done editing our birds. So let's come up to the zoom window. We're going to zoom to the article so that we can now get our design placed in the appropriate location. So we're going to work in design view. I'm going to select everything, if you remember, is control A. And I'm going to move these now up into the location where I want. I'm actually going to turn this hoop off so that I can see a little bit more. I'm going to zoom in a little closer. To there so I can see the arm and everything. Again, if you wanted to um, measure to make sure that your distancing and things were appropriate so that when you went to um, stitch this on to the, um, an actual shirt, you could measure and get things hooped in the right location. So that M key on your keyboard, remember, turns you into a um, ruler. So I could measure from the top shoulder seam. I could come down. And I am shooting for trying to get 90 degrees so that I'm straight. And so I'm about 5.9 inches, so almost 6 inches down from the top shoulder. And then I could say that I am almost three and a quarter inches from the armpit over. Okay. So you can kind of use that to measure. We could also, if you say, you know what, that's just too big. Let's get him, let's, you know, bring them down in size so that they fit more appropriate inside that area. We also have the ability to activate a guideline and a guideline can be helpful uh, for making sure that you stay within a certain area or anything along that lines. So guidelines, if they're not active, it's this function here and these are what we call guidelines. So I'm actually going to come up and if I stick, click close to zero, that's going to give me a guideline right down the center of my shirt. So I could then measure from the center of my shirt to the center of my design. And so just about three and a half inches. Okay. So the guidelines can be helpful to help you measure. Remember that um, when you are looking at a design, this crosshair that you're seeing here, or if we um, zoom out a little bit, this crosshair, that's design center. Okay, so that's why if I measure from the guideline over to design center, it's just about three and a half inches. Okay. And you could do the same sort of guideline. Um, I could do one at the bottom of the armpits, and then I could measure up from that particular guideline as well. They are movable. So if you don't get them in the right place, you know, on the first click, you can move them up and down and left and right as well. Okay. Now that our design is finished, let's press escape to turn it off. We can hit the T to look at actual um, finished design, make any changes that I want, like maybe Maybe I don't want this scroll in 
the um, same color. Let's make it color number 11, so it's a little gold. Then let's preview how it's gonna stitch, okay? So the stitch player on your um, software is this little icon right here. And so when we turn on the stitch player, what you're seeing happening on screen is the machine is actually stitching. Um, it is, these are your color stops that's showing you where it is currently in the design, what stitch count it's currently on. You have the ability to pause, stop, fast forward a color. You can adjust the speed of the stitching. So this allows you to kind of be able to preview where it's going to go, what order it's going to go in. Um, that type of thing. Very helpful when you are digitizing your own designs, making sure you have things laid out in the proper order and that you've maximized your um, thread changes and things along that lines. You can uh, jump to a section of a thread color if you're just trying to check one particular thread color when you're digitizing. You can jump through your color stops as well. Um, with the stitch player and you can play and fast forward. Okay. That is your stitch player. And at this point you can do a file save as if you would like and do it editing overview if you want to save this for any reason. And then we can close this design. Next up is going to be monogramming. So we're going to open a new file. I'm going to turn off my hoop. So I'm going to click here on the show hoop icon to deactivate the grid. In the digitized toolbox over on the left, I'm going to open up the monogramming function. And so when I open up monogramming, uh, monogramming will appear on the right hand side of your screen. The, there are 23 predefined styles in here for you of monogramming to use. Some with borders, ornaments, and lettering, some with just lettering, some with just borders and lettering. Um, we're going to go and choose style number 18BO which means border and ornament. Okay, as soon as I click on it, it's gonna apply it in the um, embroidery screen. And then we're able to make changes to it. So over in your monogramming uh, box, we're gonna click on the tab that says lettering. In here, we can change our lettering. So I'm going to type it in the order that I want to stitch it. Okay, we can change the font from the drop down box. And again, it works very much like the dialog box for regular lettering in terms you can type, uh, select it, and then start typing the font that you want. Or you can drop the box down and um, select based upon preview if you don't know exactly what you would like. As soon as we type letters and change a font, things automatically update. So at this point, um, if this looked the way that you wanted it, you could save it, export it to your machine and um, send it out uh, for embroidery. We do have the ability to edit things further. We can edit the ornaments. We have the ability to also edit ornaments. So if maybe these ornaments aren't what you wanted or you want to alter their size or location, you have the ability to do that too. So we're going to go up to the ornaments tab in the monogram docker here on the right hand side of your screen and you see that this is the name or style of your monogram ornament. We're going to click um, change, okay? 
So we're going to change the monogram ornament and the system is asking you, are you changing it? Um, do you want to choose a pattern that is defined as a monogram ornament in the software or do you want to use an embroidery design? Uh, maybe something that you created or a small little design. We're going to choose um, from design. We're going to navigate to the decorative accents folder. We're going to choose NZ943. Okay, just this little leafy swirl. And then I'm going to choose open. Now you'll notice that it instantly replaces the previous ornament with the new ornament, which is obviously not the right size. Okay, we're going to, um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to change color. Okay, so we're going to hold down um, the alt key and grab a hold of just the ornaments so that we can um, select just the ornaments so that we can change its color. Okay, so I'm going to click on a color swatch from our palette and then the um, design ornament will um, have changed to that particular color. Now, obviously way too big. So under the advanced tab over here in your monogramming docker, we have the ability to change um, the size. So I'm gonna choose the um, The ornament is there and we're going to come down to size. We're going to change the width to one and a half inches. Okay. And then we're going to um, deselect and then click back on the ornament again. And we're going to choose the layout style um, to what we call cycles. Okay. And this is just going to make the top and bottom the um, same direction versus them. This is the mirror image of each other. And so we're going to cycle it so that it is basically a duplicate. Okay. We're going to change the rotation value to 65 degrees so that they rotate and fit. And then we're going to leave a margin of... 0.15 and so that margin um, measurement is uh, the margin of space that you want between your uh, monogram letters and the borders okay so you can adjust your spacing that's there you can add um, next up is going to be borders we can add up to four borders okay in a monogram, we're only going to work, we're going to make two out of this, one of which doesn't really, it's not technically a border, but we can use the border as a fill. And so we're going to fill in the inside of this monogram with a border per se, and then we're going to have the final satin border that you see here. So with our monogram selected, we're going to click on the borders tab. We're going to add a border, okay? <clears throat> we're going to come to the Docker box here. We're going to click the first border, okay? And the first border we're going to change to a fill type, okay? And so you can see it filled in the uh, inside of our monogram with a satin stitch. We're actually going to change that to a lacework fill. Okay, we're going to choose now the second monogram, the second border in that box, and we're going to change the offset to 0.6 of an inch. And the reason being is that you can see slightly there's a gap between the outside of the lace work and the beginning of the satin stitch. And so by adjusting that offset, we are uh, closing up that gap so you can't see the end of the lace work in the beginning of the satin. They're now kind of um, centered on top of each other. So that's uh, 
how you would adjust that kind of um, the offset will fix your gaps and things between your borders. And then if uh, when you're ready, your monogram is technically um, complete. And we would do a file save as and give it a name. Okay. Next up for basics is mirror merging and creating um, duplicates. Uh, quickly creating duplicates for you. So we're going to close this file and we're going to open a new one. We're going to insert an embroidery design. So I'm going to go to insert embroidery. We're going to go to the decorative accents folder. And we want design NA471. Here's our design. I actually want to delete everything here with the exception of one of the little outer elements. And the quickest and easiest way to grab a hold of just one of these is or delete everything. Because right now, remember, everything is grouped. So if I picked anything up, it's all selecting. So if I hit delete right now, everything would go away. We are going to ungroup this. So we're going to right click on the design and we're gonna choose ungroup. And now you'll notice that when I go to click on things, it, every individual object is um, selecting, okay? So the quickest way to delete designs now is to use something that we call polygon select. So polygon select is going to allow us to draw a funny shaped box around this design to select things. Because if I left clicked and dragged, um, I'm not gonna be able to get just that particular item without grabbing a hold of something else. So it's much easier to use Polygon Select. So Polygon Select is found on the Transform toolbar. It's to the right of the blue arrow. So I'm gonna click on that. And then we start clicking and creating a lasso. So I'm actually going to just, it doesn't have to be pretty, doesn't have to be gorgeous. It just needs to encase everything except that top decorative accent. So once we're back down around at the beginning, um, don't put your beginning and ending points on top of each other. Don't close the unit, just put them close and then press enter. You'll see that everything is now pink with the exception of what we wanna keep and we're gonna hit delete. And boom, there is our one item out of that entire design that we're gonna use, okay? Now, remember we had ungrouped it, so if I wanted to glue this all back together, I need to regroup this so that I can work with it easier. So Control A is gonna select it all. You can then right click on the design and choose group or you can choose Control G, okay? And now when, um, oops, Control A, Control G. Now our item is back to being glued together. So Mirror Merge allows you to quickly create copies um, in a variety of ways and allows you to place them um, where you would like them. So with your one item selected, we're going to go to the Mirror Merge Toolbox. We're gonna look at Mirror Merging Horizontal. So when we click Mirror Merge Horizontal, you're gonna see there's a ghost copy attached to your cursor that allows you to move and um, locate the copy along the horizontal plane 
wherever you would like. You can't, moving your cursor up and down is not gonna make this move. So I can bring it over and place it where I would like it. Preferably, I would not make your items close, but not overlapping, okay? When things overlap, um, you get a question to merge an object, and instead of these being two separate objects, they become one, okay? So that's mirror merge horizontal. I'm gonna click undo. I'm gonna grab a hold of this, and this is mirror merge vertical. Same concept, okay? Except we're only working on the vertical plane. Okay. All right. And then if you can guess, mirror merge horizontal and vertical does both at the same time. Okay. So it gives you one copy um, of the design in both directions. Okay, so that you can use. This is, um, I use a lot of mirror merge horizontal and vertical to create frames and borders, um, things along that lines uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Okay, uh, we're gonna click undo there. We're gonna come back to this guy and let's talk about wreath. So the wreath tool, I'm gonna select my one design, I'm gonna click wreath and up comes a settings box. The very far right is your wreath number. This is where we're gonna set up a, um, a number of how many spokes you want your wreath to have, okay? So I'm gonna set it up for five. And now attached to my cursor are four additional copies that I can move in and out and place wherever I would like to create my wreath, okay? Now, we also have the option with, you'll notice in this that they are exact copies, just spinning around a central point. We have the ability in the software to also do what is now called mirror alternate or kaleidoscope. So when we choose a, um, even number of spokes, we have the option to choose mirror alternate. And so what that does is it allows every other copy is a mirror image, okay? So these, they have mirror imaged pairs. Mirror alternate is only um, going to work with even numbers, okay? The regular wreathing function will work with even or odd numbers, okay? But mirror alternate is only gonna work with evens because you have to have them in pairs. Okay, now you do have, let's see here, let's grab back here to this. Okay, we do have the ability to make multiple reefs. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out here. You can wreath a wreath. So if I grab a hold of this and click wreath, it's going to give me that number of copies and I can wreath a wreath, okay? Now, if you, um, if you look at this color stop wise, there are, a ton of color stops, okay? Because it's gonna stitch every single element before it moves on to the next element. Um, so we, it's gonna be easier 
to um, merge all the duplicate colors together. So it would do all of the turquoise and all of the lime green without stopping. So to do that, if you go up to the design menu and choose optimize color changes, you're going to see that the software has found the ability to change from 71 color stops to four. And if you're good with that, you just say, okay. Okay. The reason for four has to do with things that have to be stitched over top of something uh, before another color stop happens. So that's why um, some of this is stitched the way that it is. And it, you would think that, oh, it could go down to two. Um, but the way that it was wreathed or added in um, is impairing the ability to merge this because something here is was stitched earlier that can't be stitched now. Now, let's undo all of that. And let's talk around about array and reflect. Okay. So array, when you initially look at it, it's going to be like, well, that looks like mirror merge horizontal and vertical. We can actually define the number of columns and uh, spaces that we do in mirror and array. So you could use this to create a fill, you know, to fill in a background or anything along that lines quickly. And it does it, it's all aligned. You're not having to go and use mirror merge and, and, and ranging vertical and horizontal and things along that lines. So array, remember with arrays, everything is an exact copy. They're duplicates of each other. However, if you use reflect, Reflect is going to give you every other, they're going to work in mirror images. Okay, so reflect is each copy is going to be a mirror image of the previous one, but works in the same way as um, array. So that's the same as wreath and colitis or wreath and mirror alternate. Now, you could also go through and do the same concept of this with um, optimizing color changes. And then if you would like, you can go up and hit File, Save As, and save it as Mirror Merge. I'm not going to save this one. Okay. Now, last but not least, before we talk about some um, help and some basic information um, we're going to talk about true type fonts again. I told you earlier we would talk about. So true type fonts, when you, um, not all of them are going to be suitable for embroidery. So you have to do a little bit more experimenting with these fonts and settings to find um, what will work. You're going to want to look for fonts that don't have too thick or too thin of stitching areas or fonts that intermix both thin and thick together. So let's go, let's, I'm going to type in the word Brina here. And let's go down to the bottom of my box here. I am a huge font junkie, so I have a lot of fonts. So I'm just going to pick a font. Okay, and I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to click out here. And actually, that one doesn't look half bad. Not too bad. I'm going to make a copy, a couple copies. I'm going to come in. Let's go grab another one. Let's go grab. Now, you can also, you know, if you're like me, this, this font box can get really big. Okay, so you have the ability to... Um, be selective of what shows up in your font box. You only want it to show true type fonts. We can choose just true type. And now only showing in the box is going to be the true type fonts. If you know that you want a block letter for your font, you can choose block and then only the block letters are going to appear. Okay. 
So like this particular one has some spacing issues um, that would need to be taken care of with the kerning. So I would have to come into reshape. Let's look. Um, if in a true type font, if the option for auto kerning is available, so let me see if I can find a font that has that available. Maybe not. Okay, so this becomes available. If I click on that, the system is automatically going to adjust the spacing. So let's um, do that again without clicking that um, auto kerning. And so some things are not quite, it's very minor, but if auto kerning is available, you are gonna want to probably choose it so that you can um, play better with your spacing. It kind of will help you um, maybe save a little bit of time. Okay, so you can spend lots of time uh, playing with your fonts and your true types, but I would definitely um, test embroider them first before you uh, stitch them out, just so that you have a, um, a definite um, idea that it's gonna work and look the way that you want it to look. Um, you don't wanna be disappointed. So, all right. Now I'm going to, um, let's go back and we're gonna open up our um, editing one just because I like those birds. And let's go back and talk about a couple of things. So I talked about measurement systems and earlier my measurement system I said was reading in inches. Up here at the top of your screen, you, you should see a hammer and a wrench. And then right next to that, you will see a drop down box that's either going to say US or metric. And that is how you quickly um, convert your system from reading to you in inches and millimeters. So you can see now that I've changed to metric, this box is in inches, um, in millimeters. And if I change to inches, it reads to inches. Okay. Calibrating your screen. So to calibrate your screen happens up at the top under settings and you actually have an option that says calibrate screen. In this screen, uh, this dialog box pops up in the middle. You're gonna take a good old fashioned standard, you know, school ruler or a tape measure or something and you're gonna measure this actual box. I highly suggest that you do this in millimeters, okay? Um, use the millim the center meter, the center meter section of the ruler to measure this screen and enter that information. Uh, you could just measure to such a smaller measurement and a more fine-tuned measurement in metric than we can on um, the inch side of the ruler. Once you've calibrated your screen with those measurements, you just click OK and it will fix this, the zooming, basically, the zoom function so that it is displaying to you in actual correct information. So let's look at um, how to send a design to the machine. So once you have your design finished and um, ready to go, I would use this function here that looks like the little um, sewing machine. So once you've clicked the uh, write to card or machine option, up pops this particular box where you're actually gonna select the device that you want to send the design to. By choosing this, the design is gonna, con the software will convert it to the right format for the particular method that you're using. So USB sticks, okay? So the first option, USB EXP. This is going to be for machines that use the EXP format um, and you're gonna send it right to the USB stick. So you would plug your USB stick into the machine, choose the EXP, confirm 
once you click EXP, you confirm what drive the, the USB stick is on, especially if you have multiples plugged in at the same time, and then click OK and the design goes over. The next two options are grayed out. The first option here, picture of the needle, um, is what we would use to send the design directly to the machine uh, if the machine was direct connected to it. It sends it right to the machine to stitch out. It does not save it to the machine. This is also the correct the connection option that a, an Aurora 430, 440, or 450 would use in order to embroider. This would launch the EC on PC program that works your embroidery module. The next option is if you have your machine directly connected to your computer, you use this option to send it over and save it to your machine's personal folder. So you're actually saving it to the machine. This would be a deco. Okay, so uh, the deco button would be sending the design to a deco 330, 340, or a Chicago 7 machine uh, via USB stick. Next up is serial cable. So this serial port button is what you would use if you're sending the design to a 165, 170, 180, or 185 Bernina. And the last option is USB stick art, would be um, if you're sending the design to a 200 or a 730 uh, that takes USB stick, okay? Uh, it would also read, um, those machines also read the EXP format. And to be honest, the EXP format is um, slightly faster in its previewing and showing up on the screen. So for my 730s and my 200s, if you use the EXP, the EXP format, you may not be looking at the spinning spool quite as long while the machine loads um, graphic images and things along that lines. Now, as you probably noticed that your manual, your software did not come with an owner's manual, okay? Uh, your manual is built in under help and under reference manual. It is built in and I know it's, you're like, but I would like to, to look at it and read it. But this manual is a technical manual. It's not a, this is what you need to do step A to B and B to C and steps one through 44. It is, technical in that it tells you how a particular function works, okay? So the nice thing about the reference manual is that it is what I call hot keyed or hot linked. So when you're reading a portion of the manual, if anything is showing to you in red, um, if you click on it, it will take you to that portion of the manual that discusses that particular technique or um, function. I know back in the day, and I think I started with Bernina, it was version 4 software um, that had like three spiral bound manuals. It was over a thousand pages, and I can't tell you the number of post-it notes that were stuck inside that book. So it, it was just, it, it was really a pain to try to use that manual um, because it was just so hard to find where things were. You were constantly referencing back to the index. You do have an index here. So you can easily go to an index, find the topic um, that you are looking for, and then just hover over the page number and the system will take you right to that page number. Okay, so you don't even have to arrow or scroll. You just click and it goes right there. So it, it is much faster. I can recommend that you take this manual, save it to your computer, and email it to yourself. If you work on a tablet, like uh, if you have an iPad or a Kindle, you can email it to yourself. You are able to open the um, iPad or the open your email program and um, then open up your iPad. So for example, let me, so here's my iPad. So I actually saved it to my iPad. 
You can email it to yourself, open up your email, open the attachment. I can open up the manual. So now I have my manual is right here for me to use while my computer is still set up and I can work in software. So I can be looking at one thing and working on it at the same time and not have to flip back and forth from um, screen to screen. And it is even here, it's going to be hot linked um, to um, different sections of the manual. You will find, um, and it will take you to those places, your indexes and all of that are available as well in there. There are a few pieces of the manual I would print, to be honest, one of which is the keyboard shortcuts. And I know the system in the software that they give you all of those references next to the actual tools, but not all of them are listed inside the software. Um, so the keyboard shortcut um, is something that I uh, use a lot. And if you are a Mac user that is using the um, Windows, using the embroidery software on a Windows partitioned Mac, um, so you're still using it on the Windows side of the machine. Um, they give you the uh, Mac conversions because you don't have control keys. You don't have an alt key. So you have a few other things. So if you're a Mac user um, operating with the boot camp and the Windows partition, um, these are helpful because the Mac portions are not written inside the software as kind of your... Um, shortcuts. So remember, if you look up at a function, control G is how you would group something and control U is ungroup. However, in, in a Mac, those are going to be different because for you, it would be command G and things like that. So they just becomes helpful. You, the more you use your software, the easier it's going to get uh, type thing. The other thing that I would print from the manual are the appendixes A through F, I believe is the letter. So A through F, and specifically, if anything, embroidery, uh, in, oh my goodness, appendix B, it talks about fonts. Because this is going to be, especially if you bought your software for fonts, the true type fonts that are in your, the, um, not true type, the embroidered fonts that are built into your software that came with your software, they all have a minimum and a maximum size they should be stitched at. And so if you're taking a font that is designed to be big and you are shrinking it really small and having challenges with it, it's usually because you're working outside of the capacity of that particular font. So for example, if I look at this tabloid font, this tabloid font should not be any smaller than 1.2 inches in height, okay? And it shouldn't be any bigger than three inches. So you should make sure that if you are trying to do this font and have it only be a half inch tall, this is not gonna be the right font for it. So I would spend some time looking through your fonts and looking for something that has been digitized to operate best at those smaller sizes. Now we do have in the software, um, there are four fonts that are digitized and created for you that are considered small. Meaning that these fonts are what I would use for um, uh, company logos and things for shirts because they're designed to be no bigger than like a quarter of an inch tall, okay? And so usually that's where we see things happening a lot is going to be with um, those monograms and quilt labels and things like that where you're trying to take a font that is, you know, almost an inch and trying to embroider it much smaller and that's going to become a challenge 
because you're going to start to see underlay and things. Your E's and your I's aren't going to look like let those letters in that type of thing. Now, the other thing that you do have are in those appendixes are we earlier played around with step changing step file step fills and fancy fills and things along that lines. Well, you know, that step fill list was 30 step fills. What, how am I supposed to know what step fill number eight looks like or number 12 looks like? So Appendix D is going to give you a graphic image um, to show you what those fills look like. You know, so you don't have to constantly change the fill and then preview it and then change it and preview it until you find the one that you want. Um, so these appendixes become helpful in that aspect. The other thing that comes helpful in it is in your software, you have, let me open here, a, let's go back here to library, under Bernina version 8 software, you have a folder that's called reference files. And when you look at these reference files, I'm going to specifically pull up step fills. There are four different step fill patterns. So I'm going to open this. And so you could actually embroider this. And um, when you embroider it, this kind of gives you a live action preview as to what something's going to look like. Um, so even if the... Um, the um, printed versions are really still hard for you to be able to tell as well. You can embroider these out. So for example, this is actually the beginning of fancy fills. Uh, so you have, um, it stitches out a square and gives you the number that's associated with those particular fills. You want an idea as to what stitch angles look like. There are um, reference files for all of the fonts stitched out um, so that you can kind of get a preview as to what those particular fonts look like. There are reference files for all your pattern outlines, pattern runs, um, decorative stitches that are built in to your uh, corners, all your monogramming elements, uh, things along that lines. Let's see. Reference files here. So all your fills, buttonholes, monogram ornaments, black work fills, black work borders, alphabets. Inside of there, everything is um, there for you. Now, it does take a while to embroider. I'll tell you. Um, I have been doing this for uh, 17, 18 years. Um, I still don't have my reference files um, all stitched out. So if anybody ever gets bored and wants to stitch two sets, I would graciously accept a set of them um, for to use and to fill my book with because I just not have not gotten to, to stitching all of them yet. It seems like I get them done and then a new version of software comes out and then there are new pages to add. So <coughs> when new versions of software come out, you don't have to um, stitch all of them over again. So for example, in alphabets, you'll see that these, these two files were the new ones that were added in version four. These were the three that were added in version five version six, these are the fonts, seven, these are the fonts, and then version eight, they, um, we didn't, there's a few new um, three-dimensional fonts that um, they don't have a reference file for, but the, they are broken out and things like that, so it's just good to have, especially if you are uh, big into creating your own designs and things along that lines and want to, uh, just kind of be able to see what things look like, especially if you're designing. I mean, it's hard to tell. There's, There are lots and lots of 
decorative stitches on the machine and it's sometimes easier to pick one if you can see what it looks like when you stitch it out. Okay. Now, I hope that was helpful and the beginning of um, learning or getting more comfortable with your software. To be honest, it's not going to get any easier if you only open your software once in a blue moon. Okay. You really need to pull it out, open it up and just play with it. If anything, it's really, it's fun, fun to do. You can't do anything to hurt it. The one thing that you do want to get in the habit of doing is let me, um, close my software here and close these screens is, a good habit is in your version eight software and, and any software we have the ability to um, purge a recovery file and in purging a recovery file you want to get in the habit of doing this at the end of any uh, work session and basically what that is is that you have the ability to delete that backup folder when you're working in your software there are auto saves that happen and those auto saves fill into this folder and then over time the folder gets fuller and fuller and then things stop cooperating or your software starts to act funny so if you just get a habit of every time you finish um, stitching or finish playing in your software is to come in and purge your recovery folder and so there are a couple of places that you can find it if you're familiar with this is when I'm I'm operating in Windows 10 um, so I can come to my Bernina version 8 section and then there's my purge recovery option when that opens I can hit delete backup files and choose OK and it just tells me they've been successfully deleted if you have your Cortana search on the Windows you can type in the word purge recovery and then choose open and it will open for you or you can put a shortcut right directly onto your desktop to run as well. So there's a lot of options for you to be able to uh, purge that particular recovery. So I hope that you have found everything helpful and will join me for the next lesson in Embroidery Mastery where we will talk about the automatic digitizing portion of the Bernina Embroidery software. Thank you and have a great day.